Fire away. Steve Blass, we were, interviewed him on Tuesday. He was down in Jamestown. And he was talking about Richie Hebner. Oh, you know, God. He does good, he know him up in Buffalo? Yeah. Does, he, he okay. Does. And uh, so one of the things we did was talk about, of course, you. Uh, and he had some good stories about you. But I bet you have a, probably a story or two about Steve Blass. Nah, he was just a fun guy. Uh, you know, the sad thing about him, his biggest asset was throwing strikes. And all of a sudden, he comes to spring training that, uh, I'm not sure what year it was. 73. 73. He couldn't throw a strike. And it was the saddest thing. He never bounced back. And he was still young. He could have pitched three or four more years in the big leagues easily. I mean, I think he was 32 when it happened. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we were taking batting practice down. Pirate City, and he couldn't. He took. He couldn't throw a ball inside the in the cage. He was throwing. Everybody felt sorry for him because he was so well liked, and everybody said, "Well, I hope he comes back. Hope he comes back." And he never did. Right. Sad. It was a sad. Uh, you know, you got to figure the. He wins a seventy-one World Series. I don't know. He was good up until that happened. I mean, he was win games, throw strikes, get ground balls. Yeah. Does it get any better than that? And all of a sudden, ba boom, couldn't throw a ball over the plate. Sad case. Was there much counseling? I mean, much, it's, it's a difficult thing to watch from the player's perspective. Oh, well, yeah, because he was so well liked. Everybody's rooting for this guy. And yeah. I think they sent him to this doctor, that doctor, and uh, didn't work out. Yeah. Sad. One of the things I did with uh, Steve, and it's uh, because 71 to a lot of Pirate fans was, of course, a magical year, and you were in the middle of all that. Was I showed him this thing which we had, which was sort of a team book of players, and showed. I said, Steve, is, are there reminiscences? I mean, in this, or a thought, or a process, or a story, or something as you go through that, from a from a player's perspective. And I've never seen this book. This is a nice book. I found it just the other day. It was in my archive, so clearly. Nice book. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you want to know? Well, anyways, if you're looking at some names and you, and you look at uh, whether it's Clemente or Grant, you've got a story or a comment or a... Mudcat Grant, lead off. Yep. First big league home run off him. Is that right? In Jerry Park, May 15, 1969, a low 3-1 fastball. How's that? Jackie Hernandez. We wouldn't have won the World Series without Jackie Hernandez. He played mm -hmm. tremendous shortstop. Clemente, everybody knows about Clemente. Great player. Sad thing that the, the, the day he got the 3,000 hit, it was a rainy, crappy day in uh, Three Rivers Stadium against the Mets. Got a double off of John Matlack. There was only like 14,000 people in the stands. Yeah. I know it was a bad day, but it's funny. We, as good as we played, it, you know, it's a football town. No question. I mean, last year they juiced it up last year at Pittsburgh, winning, which was great. Uh, Bob Robinson, I room with him my first three years in the big leagues. Big, strong kid. Justy was a great trade getting him from the uh, Cardinals. Uh, relief pitcher, did a good job. Uh, you know, Nelly Browse, great guy. He came from the Cardinals too. Was that in the same deal? No, I don't, I don't think it was. I don't think it was. I don't think it was. I'm going through these pictures. I could probably have a story for every one of them. Yeah, go ahead. Doc Ellis. Character, but a good guy. Every once in a while, every once in a while uh, Doc wanted to say one and one was three, just to be different. But he was, teammate, he was a good guy. Yeah. He really was. But people out, outside the clubhouse, you know, they had their own opinion, but good guy. You know, he threw that no-hitter in San Diego. They said he was kind of out of it a little bit, but... I don't know, he threw a no-hitter, it, it was a nice, I played third that night, it was pretty interesting. But they, they, he had a few, a little bit of wild, though, wasn't he? Didn't he have a few walks? I think he had six or seven walks, six walks or something. Yeah. Uh, Jose Pagan, good player, good player, good utility player, good pickup. Stodge, we all know Willie. I batted behind Willie for a couple of years there, you know, and back then, you know, I don't think it happens now, but back then, the, you know, Willie hit the home run, the next guy got hit. And I always said, you know, why hit me? <laughs> He's the guy that hit the ball 450 feet. So I got, a, I got a few black and blues because of Willie. And I told Willie, don't hit him so far. <laughs> Willie, I'm up next, and I'm an innocent soul. 
I'm, I think I'm a nice guy, and I'm getting drilled in the leg and the <laughs> neck and the arm. Willie would just laugh. Sanguine, always smiling, great personality, played hard, good catcher. Bob Veal, good guy. Lives in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, great guy. Did you ever find, I know I was at a couple of games where we were just kind of misty and uh, rainy and, and, and Veal's pitching, and, and guys just simply, you could just sense the other team kind of scared as if this guy can't even see what's thrown at. Well, he was, he was intimidated. He was six foot eight. Uh, too hard and a little bit wild, so you kind of a little tippy toe in the batter's box. You know, you don't want to get hit with a 95 mile an hour fastball. I don't think anybody want to get hit. Yeah. So he was a little intimidated. Cash played good. Cash and I, and uh, it's funny, the guy that signed me, Chick Whalen, had three guys in that 71 team Steve Blass, Dave Cash, and me. That's pretty good. Mm -hmm. One scout, yeah. Chick Whalen. Good guy. Passed away a few years ago. Is there any relation to Danny Whalen? No, no, him. no. Bob Moose, I went in the Marine Corps with him. They had two openings because of the Vietnam War. Mm. And, uh, you know, because if you didn't go to the reserves, you know, two years, one year was in Vietnam. You didn't know if you are going to come back with a tag on your toe or not. So he and I went over, then he gets killed in, his, gets killed in a car accident on his birthday. Oh, gosh. His 30th birthday. Sad. Luke Walker. Someone told me about Luke about a month ago. He, I think he's still a cop in Texas. And I always said to Luke, I said, I'd be afraid to see you with a gun in your hand, Luke. <laughs> Dale Oliver, good hitter. Got a lot of votes for the Hall of Fame. Got a lot of, a lot of hits, 2,800 or something, close to 29. Was he one of the real pure hitters that you knew? Good hitter, yeah. Hit a lot of balls hard. Good hitter. Good first base. Good teammate. Mm, I haven't seen him in a long time. Everybody knows about Maz. Very quiet guy. Very shy guy. Yeah. yeah. Gene Alley. I think Gino could have played two or three more years. He just, he kind of just kind of said, that's it for me. Because I think he retired. I don't, I'm not sure the age, but he wasn't that old. No, he wasn't. And he played good. And someone said he got the most votes in the 1966 All-Star game. You can look that up. Yeah. That's a pretty good accomplishment. You bet. I mean, he could play shortstop. I was looking at a picture in one of the yearbooks, uh, and I saw you with Pie Trainer. Pie Trainer, yeah, that was early 1969, 70. Pie would come down to spring training. Pie was from originally from Somerville, Mass. And I'm from Norwood, Mass, not far away. And it was sad they retired his number after he, after he died. Yeah. Someone said he was walking downtown Pittsburgh, he dropped dead or something. And the next opening day the next year, which I don't know what it was, 72, 73, I gave his uniform to his wife. Uh. But a lot, of, a lot of teams don't like to retire numbers. Pi got in the Hall of Fame in 1947, I believe. Yeah, really, really. And the only team like to retire numbers are the Yankees. You got a young guy come up with the Yankees now, he's wearing 82, you know, tight end for the New York Giants. Yeah, yeah. But uh, it's funny, I had two numbers retired and uh, I got to pay to get in the Hall of Fame. I bought Pie Trainer, then I got traded to Detroit, and they gave me number two. And I walked out in Lakeland, and a couple of writers said, do you feel funny with that uniform on? I'm looking around going, what the hell are they talking about? Charlie Garringer, I wore number two for three years. Sure. And that number should have been retired. But like I said, a lot of teams don't like to retire numbers. I mean, Charlie Garringer, Pie Trainer. Pretty good players. Pretty good players, that's right. And it took Pi 57, six, took Pi probably 26 years after he got in. And the poor guy died and, he, and they retired his number. But like I said, some teams just don't, uh, don't retire his numbers easy unless you're a New York Yankee. Yeah. You had a chance to really, in that period of time of, of 1971, just hearkening back to this year, uh, where during the uh, NL National League uh, Championship Series, you, you took a couple Hall of Famers down here. Yeah, Gaylord Perry and Juan Marichal. Yeah. It's funny that year, we played them 12 times. We beat them three, they beat us nine. Mm -hmm. Then we go out to, you know, we play them out there. Bob Robinson hits three home runs, first game. And we beat them three, uh, three games to one. But uh, yeah, they had our number. They had a good team. They had some good teams, uh, but it was nice. Hit a home run off of Gaylord Perry, 
and then I hit a uh, home one the next day off a of Mary show. And then shortly thereafter, as you're playing the Orioles, you hit a home run off another Hall of Famer. Division. Yeah, yeah, uh, Jim Palmer. That was a big. That was a big home run I hit. We were losing 11 nothing. I hit a three run home. We lost 11 to three. <laughs> I would have liked to get that ball. The ball was in the stands, and it never came out. I would have liked to get get that ball, but. Talking about Hall of Famers, I got my first hit in the big leagues. I was afraid to get the ball. Really? Bob Gibson. Oh, my gosh. Tough cookie. You bet. You take a big swing at him. I mean, the next pitch got a chance to be behind your neck. Yeah. So I got my first hit off of uh, Bob Gibson, uh, April of 1969 in Bush Stadium. Was, was, he, was, was he that intimidating? Yes, and he was good. Yeah. You know, he was good. Look at his ERA back then. Oh, it's unbelievable. One point something. I mean, guys in the big leagues now have an ERA of four point something. They're making $12 million. I mean, his ERA was, and he had a lot of complete games. And he was not an easy out at the play. He was a good athlete. He was a good athlete. Good body, uh, threw hard, good breaking ball, good stuff. J.R. Richards. Probably the toughest pitcher I ever faced. Yeah. Plus, when you played in the dome, it was tough to see the ball there. Right. Plus, you were 6'8", threw close to 100 miles an hour. When he finished winding up, you could almost smell his breath when he ate that, <laughs> when he ate that morning. <laughs> he was nasty. Yeah. Uh, he's probably the toughest pitcher I've ever faced. Plus, he was just, you know, like I said, he was just, he was wild enough where, you know, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to get hit with a guy throwing 100 miles an hour. So he's up and over and he's a tough guy to hit. It's too bad he had that stroke. I mean, if he stayed healthy, he could have had some unbelievable numbers. Yeah. And he was, he, I guess he complained. Nowadays, you complain of an uh, ingrown toenail, they'll say they'll send him to the Mayo Clinic. But he was complaining, and I don't think they, they took him serious. And he had a, a stroke, I believe. And uh, I really don't know how many years he pitched in the big leagues, but if he pitched, if he pitched 10, 12 years in the big leagues, he would have had some kind of numbers. Sure. Strikeouts, woo. You, you managed, uh, you're with a couple of managers, uh, Danny Murtaugh, uh, Larry Shepard. Uh, can, can you distinguish those guys? Shepard wasn't there that long. I, Shepard got fired uh, at the end of the 69 season. That's when Murtaugh came in. But I had Shepard, Murtaugh, Billy Burden, back to Murtaugh, Chuck Tanner. So I had a different character. Chuck was easy. Danny was kind of easy, but saw, never missed a trick. Billy Verdon was tough. Larry Shepard was quiet. Larry's a good guy. Went to Mass every day. A real gentleman. Mm -hmm. But he got fired, and Murtaugh came in, and then we started winning. You and Verdon didn't necessarily get CI to eye on everything, did you? Nah, I didn't. No, not, not really. But he, Billy was a, Billy's a good guy. Billy's a good guy. I, just, I was a young guy. He said some things that... I kind of hit a nerve with Billy, and we kind of clashed a little bit. But I see Billy at fantasy camps. Billy's, you know, Billy's almost 80 years old. He yeah. still looks good. That's still looks good. But it's funny about Murtaugh. We used to fly all over the country playing baseball, and, and, and we, had, we had a radio guy, Bob Prince. Bob would have about six or seven screwdrivers in the back <laughs> of the plane, and Bob would, Bob would feel pretty good. And Danny, we used to read these cowboy books about 100 pages. And he'd fall asleep on the plane. And, uh, Prince would always go up and rip the last 20 pages out of the book. <laughs> now, Murtaugh would get up and start, Hey, son of a gun, where were you, Prince? It was all the time. And they used to do that. You do that in the big leagues. Now you have a fight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you can't believe what we used to do in the big leagues. Yeah. Stuff like that. And... Uh, and Murtaugh would never finish a book. <laughs> <laughs> funny, funny stories. Well, give me your best Bob Prince story. That was one of them, but Prince, would, he jumped off. I wasn't there when he jumped out of the window in St. <laughs> Louis into the pool. That took some nerve. Yeah. I mean, he slipped or a, 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 a something happened, you know. I might have been digging his grave. Yeah. <laughs> but Prince was a character. I mean, the Prince... Uh, Jim Woods, uh, Vince Scully's still around. Uh, the guy in St. Louis, great guy. Uh, his son, uh, Buck, Jack Buck. Jack Buck. You know, those announcers are all gone now. I mean, they were, they were characters. Harry Carey. 
Yeah, Prince was, uh, yeah, Prince would be up, thought he was off the air doing a commercial. Him and Woods would be up in Forbes Field and looking with binoculars going, God, look at that blonde down there. And it was, they, didn't, they thought they were off. It was more than a blonde. There was other comments, but I can't see them right now. <laughs> but they get caught a few times uh, looking through the binoculars uh, <laughs> in the stands. <laughs> Grieved you. You mentioned the fact. I mean, how often have people asked you about your, your that, that whole connection with your dad, your brother, and yeah. Sort of I dug graves for thirty-five years, pick and shovel. Really? Yeah, pick and shovel. And up at where I live, that ground gets frozen. Then you get a ninety-pound jackhammer. A lot of people thought it was it was it was PR. You know, Kirk Gowdy used to do the game Saturday afternoon, game of the week, and we were a lot of game of the week. And Kurt would would mention it, and a lot of people would say, Ah, that's that's baloney. And I tell people, you want to come up in the middle of January, watch me dig a grave in a blizzard with a 90-pound jackhammer? Come on up. I'm not lying. Yeah. I did it for 35 years. No kidding. I buried a lot of people. You, I was reading a story, if you could maybe re, if you recite it, if you could remember it, is uh, dealing with the, uh, the Jewish cemetery quite the issue. You know, you said that... Uh, I worked in a Jewish cemetery. Yeah, yeah. And apparently there was a story about... Uh, uh, possessing a wicked sense of humor, Hebner delighted telling his teammates the story of one particular incident as a grave digger. It's a Jewish cemetery. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll dig the grave and they'll bury this man. Well, the wife sees the husband being lowered into the ground and she throws herself on top of the casket. Mm -hmm. she, she caught a foot in between the casket and, the, and you know, this, this much space between them. And we couldn't get her out. <laughs> and we couldn't get her out. My brother, my brother Dennis had a couple of beers in him. And he told the rabbi, he says, well, leave her in there. We'll give him a discount. We'll bury both of them. <laughs> but that didn't go over big. <laughs> I got a lot of great stories about the cemetery. Matter of fact, there's a guy in uh, Tom Gage. He's been a beat writer for the Tigers for 40 years. Good friend of mine. And we were in Lakeland this spring. And Tom said, I've never wrote a book, but I want to write a book about you. And I kind of laughed. I said, ah, come on. But when I think of it, you know, I got 22 years in the big leagues. I dug graves for 35 years. Now I work in a funeral home for the last 11 years. Who the hell has done that? <laughs> I, know. I got some great stories, and I got another funny story. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm doing. I'm driving the hearse about three years ago, and the priest didn't go with me, so I had my cell phone on the in the, on the seat, and the cops leading the pack with his flashes on, and I'm about five miles from the cemetery. My phone rings. I says, I you know I'm not going to wake the guy up behind me, so I'm, I'm going to answer the phone. Hi, this is uh, Dave Stockstill. Went, well, you know, he was. A f he says, "I'm sorry, I'm gonna let you go." I get fired driving the hearse. So I look back. I said, "You think you're having a bad day? I just, got, I just got shit canned." <laughs> True story. I get fired driving the hearse to the cemetery. Oh I don't think that's ever happened to anybody. No, I'm sure it hasn't happened to anybody. Was it? Was it tough? You had a long relationship with the pirates. Was it tough when they finally had to kind of deal with you? Well, I, I tell people, you know, when you're there for eight, nine years, and you, you know, I was kind of a popular Irish kid that talked funny, that played in Pittsburgh with a lot of Irish and hunkies. Oh, sure. oh yeah. And what happened was, Galbert, they offered me 80, 90, 100,000. That's, that's 270, right? Uh, oh, yeah. Now, uh, General manager for the Phillies back then, a good friend of mine. What the hell is his name? Died. Uh, not Ruley Carpenter. Anyway, the Phillies called me mm -hmm. and said, we're going to offer you 600000 Now, I didn't go to Harvard or anything, but I ain't that stupid. Now, you're going to talk about two seventy to 600000 What would you do? Yeah. I didn't want to leave Pittsburgh, but the money... And everybody brings up the money about these hungry ball players, and this and that. But you take Joe Schmo off the street, and you say, "Do you want two seventy or six hundred? How many people would take two seventy? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the reason. That's why I went to Philadelphia. I didn't want to leave Pittsburgh because I was there eight years. I knew a lot of people there. We won. But it's funny. I signed with the Phillies. We win. We get in the playoffs the next two years. Yeah. And you played. You went over to first base, right? Yes. I had two good years here, and I don't want to be I, I, I. I had two good years, and all of a sudden, Bill Giles wanted Pete Rose. And Pete came, and guess who went out the door? Me. Yeah. I went to the Mets. 
I went from a first place team to a team that couldn't beat the Cooks at the Hilton Hotel. We lost 99 games that year. It was a tough year. Fly, planes flying over LaGuardia. It was a miserable year. And uh, general manager then who works for the Red Sox now, uh, Joe. He offered McDonald. me McDonald. Joe McDonald, good guy. I like Joe. Joe offered me a three-year deal to stay with the Mets. I said, Joe, I hate to tell you, Joe, you can offer me a 12-year deal. I ain't staying here. Right. And I'm an Easterner, you know. But people like New York or don't like New York. I didn't care for New York. It was hustle, bustle. Plus, we didn't win. You know, we won two games a week. With Christ, we celebrated with champagne. We thought we won the World Series. <laughs> so what happened was I was out carving pumpkin with my two daughters, and my wife comes out and says, hey, there's somebody on the phone, Sparky. Who the hell? Who's Sparky? And I get traded. It was Sparky Innocent. He called me. He says, welcome to Detroit. And I stopped carving a pumpkin with my two young girls. I went in. I said, okay, Spock, I'll see you in Lakeland. How were your years at, with the Tigers? Good. I, I like Tiger Stadium. It's a beautiful ballpark yeah, yeah. to play in. Unfortunately, it's been ripped down. Yeah. But um, Spock was a good guy to play for. Hard nosed guy. I mean, I don't know if Sparky could manage the 2014 player. You know, I mean, you almost. I don't know. I don't know how many guys are making $12 million have to be told they're good. You don't have to. I mean, if I'm making $12 million, you don't have to pat me in the fanny. Yeah. <laughs> but Sparky was an old time manager, and he just, you know, you play hard, you played. You didn't play hard, you didn't play. Yeah. Sparky would have meetings, would last about two minutes, get right to the point, ba boom. You have managers now will talk a half hour. After 15 minutes, you get half the guys in the back room sleeping and uh, saying, when's this idiot going to finish talking? Mm -hmm. Sparky had quick meetings, right to the point, bob boom, let's go. That's the way I like it. You could talk too much in a meeting, and you ain't going to get nothing out of these players. Right, right. They're gonna, they'll probably want to give you a standing ovation when you end, but they won't. <laughs> <laughs> Was your highlight year the 71 Pirates? Yeah, 71 was a good year. Uh, uh, you know, coming through the tunnel, beating Baltimore and, and looking at 300,000 people downtown. It was like he had goosebumps. It was amazing. And I had a World Series ring on when, when I was 23 years old. But I think the biggest, one of the biggest drills is I graduated in high school in 66. And if you told me I was going to be in a clubhouse in Forbes Field, September of 68, two years later, two lockers from Clemente and Mazeroski, Gene Alley. I'd say, what the hell am I doing here? Mm -hmm. But two years out of high school, I was in, I was in, the, and I, that was a big, that was a big thrill playing in old Forbes Field. That was a great, a lot of people, I, you know, listened to this interview, never even seen Forbes Field, but that was a very unique ballpark. Uh, great downtown Oakland. Exactly. Yeah, you can walk across the street after the game, go into Frankie Gustine's, get a nice cold beer. Or... They had all a little place around there. Then they opened the ballpark down Three Rivers. There was nothing around Three Rivers. That's why the new ballpark in Pittsburgh, I think it's the prettiest ballpark in baseball. They got everything around there. Three Rivers Stadium had nothing. When the game was over, you had to get the heck out of there. Forbes Field had a lot of, you know, right around the University of Pitt. Uh, but Mazeroski's, that wall was still up. Have you seen it? Yeah, yeah. Still up with the vines on it. They kept that up. It's a big medical building, I guess, uh, the University of Pitt put up. But, but I drove by there a couple of years ago and see the wall up there where Mads hit the home run. That's pretty cool. Well, they still annually replay the game on time. I mean, in other words, they, they clock at yeah. 1 o'clock, and a, 150 people will show up. And then uh, one year, they limoed in Mazeroski just to sit there really? with a beer. You know, listening to the last inning, of course, and it was just cool. I made a mistake. I told Maz, my, one of my first years there, I said, you know, Maz, I came home from St. Catherine's School in my, blue sh sh my sh white shirt and my blue tie, parochial school. I rushed home, and I was a Yankee fan. You hit that ball over the fence. I kind of, and I said, why the hell am I telling this to Maz for? Maz just laughed. That's he loves it. Yeah. But I was a Yankee fan. I, always, I wished I was signed by the Yankees, but I... I was the number one draft pick from the Pirates. I was the 15th pick of the country that year. And, uh, and back then, I didn't know. Number one draft pick, I didn't know. I mean, number one draft pick makes now $3 million, don't they? Yep. 
just 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 for yeah. an autograph. Give me. Do you have a Clemente story? Well, Clemente was. Uh, Okay. No, I'm, I'm all set. It's almost three, that's all. Yeah, yeah I'm, all, I'm all set. But uh, Clemente was, uh, I don't know, I guess he was in a slump. He goes in a slump, he doesn't get a hit for two days. But anyway, Clemente was in L.A. and he told Tony Bob, well, run me down with, I don't know if you heard this story, run me down with goat milk. And Tony says, what the hell is this guy talking about? He runs him down with goat milk, he gets four or five hits that night in Dodger Stadium. He does it the next night. He gets three or four hits again. Oh, geez, everybody want to go out and buy goat milk. <laughs> because a lot of guys went in the clubhouse, when Tony was rubbing him down, they said, ah, he's, he's full of crap. He's not rubbing. He, was, he had goat milk, and he's, putting, he's rubbing goat milk on his back. I'm going, you've got to be kidding me. I was going to go out and buy three gallons of goat milk. See if I get out of the slump. <laughs> but it's funny. Uh, you know, they made a statue of Clementi. Mm -hmm. Someone made a statue and put it in the trainer's room, in Tony Bottom's trainer's room. Okay. And then Clemente never knew anything about it. So Clemente walked around the corner, looked in, and he almost passed out. It looked just like Clemente. And they made a statue. And that was a funny thing. Uh, there's so many funny things that happened back then. I was, uh, You know something? I should write a book. You should. I should write a book. And it's the kind of thing Tom Gage sits and does this. I mean, he actually asks you to just ask lots of questions. And it just comes back. Just oh, everything. Point. You you mentioned a name to me. The, the, most likely, I'll have a story yeah, yeah. of a player. Yeah. You know, and I've been in the minor league 17 years. I get some great, you know, I mean, I've I've coached some, some good players uh, who's making a lot of money in the big leagues. But it's nice. It's nice to work in the minor leagues, see a guy get the big leagues and do well. Maybe you feel maybe I was a little part of it, you know. Yeah. But What is the funniest thing that happened to Richie Hebner? Funniest thing happened to me? Jeez, I don't even know. Uh, I can't even think what happened. Uh, probably somebody funny. I can't even think what. Uh, or maybe something that you saw that was really funny. You get one of those deals where you say, "Greg, you I, you can't believe this story." Uh, you know something? I'm blank right now. To be honest with you. Was there a guy who really intimidated you? I mean, just from, I mean, J.R. Richards you talked about, but the J.R. Richards was a good, yeah, he was good. Uh, uh, Seaver was good. You know, these guys around here now in the minor leagues, I'm coaching, say, ah, oh, these guys didn't throw hard back then. They got, I said, let me tell you, they said, yes, they did throw hard. You know, when I came up to big leagues, there was only, I think there was only like uh, 18 teams in the league. Now there's 30 teams in the league. It, it's it's pretty watered down. Yeah. But it gives a chance for these guys to make money. You know, my first year, my first three or four years in the big leagues, my paycheck, I could go to a gas station, cash it, and get a six-pack of beer. Right. I mean, I didn't know what a bank was until my fifth or sixth year in the big leagues. Yeah. But now the big leagues, the minimum in the big leagues is $500,000. You know what the minimum in the big leagues was when I came my first year in the big leagues, 1969? It's 500000 now. What do you think it was in 1969? $5,000. $10,000. $10,000. $10,000. Wow. I had 301 my rookie year. That's a, that's the thing that, it doesn't bother me. It bothered me for a while, but it, Pittsburgh's not a, a real good PR town. Mm -hmm. But I had three, 301 my rookie year and never got a vote for rookie of the year. Just, yeah. Teddy Sizemore got it. Coco Boy got some votes. Larry Heisel got some votes. Al Oliver got some votes. I didn't get a half a vote. And, uh, you know, I had like 470 at bats. It wasn't like I had yeah. 240. I was going to ask you, just, uh, I don't know your timing, but... <clears throat> no, I can go to 3 o'clock. Okay, that's terrific. Uh, thank you very much for doing that. Uh, you had, at, that, that's kind of 70, 71 season... The first all-black yeah. was that a conversation? Oh, it was headlines in the paper in Pittsburgh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we didn't think nothing of it, but the Pits, people in Pittsburgh, you know, they, they, made, they, made some, they made a big issue out of it. But, you know, we had good players. We had good players. You know, we just, you know, you know, back then we had a lot of black, a lot of Latin, some, you know, a lot of white. It was like a mixture. I called it the UN building. When I walked in the clubhouse, I thought it was the UN building. We had guys speaking Spanish and English, and then some, this guy was speaking over here. I'm going, ah, this is an interesting 
Maybe I'll learn some Spanish before I get out of here. Did you? No, not really. <laughs> it, it was, but uh, we had good players. You know, they, you know, I hear people nowadays, you know, chemistry is a big thing in baseball. Yeah, maybe, but you know something, I'll take good players. Good players win chemistry, you know. Not, not every team, 25 players, going to like each other. I don't care what team you're talking about. Give me good players. Good players will win. Bad players, you get a pink slip. you would be looking in the one ads. Yeah. Was there a leader? Kind of a guy who you... Uh... Stodge, I think, looked. You know, everybody looked up to Stodge. And Clemente ran every ball out. So if you see Clemente running balls out, you know, 38 years old, I yeah. mean, you better bust your ass. But Maz was, uh, Maz was around. Maz didn't say much. But they knew the background of Maz. So they said, you know something? It was a good mixture. We had all the players. In 1969, they went with three rookies. Myself, Manny Singh, and Al Oliver. They said, you know, we're going to go with three rookies, and we're going to start trying to build this thing up. And it, it worked out. We got in the, you know, every time I went to spring training, I'd tell my father, put the shovel away a little longer. And he said, why? He said, we play in the playoffs. Mm -hmm. The other teams be home watching us in the living room. Yeah. You kind of knew we were going to get win in the playoffs. I mean, I've been in 11 playoffs. Ten as a player, one as a coach. You know. That's a lot. That's a lot of playing you in October with a lot of guys at home playing golf or getting ready to put the TV on and watch us play. Nice. Do folks on this team here know who you are? Do they know your 18-year career? I think they do. I think you get a little uh, uh, respect when you get a guy around as much as I've been around. I think they treat me good. I think that's one of the reasons. You know, sometimes in, in triple A, double A, if you get a hitting coach or pitching coach that maybe went to double A, never played in the big leagues, I don't, and I'm not putting a halo on my head, believe me, but I don't think they get respect like, you know, like I do. These guys do know I played in the big leagues, and they know, they know I have two World Series rings, right, right. you know, and uh, so it helps. Yeah. And these guys are good here. You know, I've been 11, 11 years in triple A. This might be one of the best groups I've had for for good guys, good guys. Even though they go up and down, up and down. You know, you get a guy coming down, he mopes. I don't like mopers. And you get a guy coming down from the big leagues and mopes. And the only thing I can say is, you know, get better, you go up there. If you don't want to get better, go home. If you need a ride to the airport, I'll give you one. Because yeah. if you come down and mope, there's 24 other guys trying to get to the big leagues. Don't ruin it for them. Right. If you come down and you, you don't want to be down here, go home. I don't sugarcoat anything. I'm kind of from the old school. I tell it like it is. I ain't going to pat anybody in the ass and, you know, you know, let's go, let's go. You in AAA, you should know you're one step in the big leagues. If you can't turn it up here, you got a problem, especially the way they're giving money in the big leagues. Yeah. And if you got a, if you, you got a wife or you're married, she's going to get on your butt and say, hey, let's get back to big leagues. The checks, the zeros are a little bit more... Zeal's in this check in, in AAA. <laughs> Are you watching the Bruins? Is that your team? Yeah. Tough loss last night. Tough penalty. Seven seconds after the penalty, Montreal scored. That's right. A lot of hatred there. It's like the Red Sox-Yankees series. Yeah. You know, you can see rivals, Michigan, Ohio State, Red Sox, Yankees, Bruins, Montreal. I don't know. But that's one of the top five. Right. They don't like each other. I recommend the Bruins win tomorrow afternoon in, yeah. in Boston. I mean, I'm not giving up if they're down two games or nothing, but I don't think you want to be down two games or nothing going into Tuesday in Montreal. No, 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 no. No, no. Who was your hero? I mean, you were, that's really, was your sport, hockey. It's at, when you was your high school, who was, who was your hero? Bobby Orr? Well, Bobby Who's... Orr, Bobby Hull. I met Bobby Hull one night. That was a big throw. But I could have signed with the Bruins or the Red Wings. Mill Schmidt off me uh, to go up at Agnify Flyers up in uh, Canada. And Bobby Orr was on the other team. Bobby Orr was in the Austria Generals. I would have played in the, the Flyers who were Bernie Perrant, Derek Sanderson, Giles Morat, Don Oey, Glenn Sather, uh, uh, Westfall. Yeah. About eight, or, eight or nine guys in that team were in, the, were in the NHL within two years. But I picked baseball. A lot of people in my hometown didn't like when I signed with the Pirates. They knew me as a hockey player. When you played high school hockey, there was 5,000 people at the game. If you didn't get there an hour before the game, you weren't getting in. Yeah. High school baseball, there was five people at the high school game. <laughs> so people knew me up there as a hockey player. So when I signed with the Pirates, they went, ah, you know, I want to see this kid play hockey. I was a better hockey player than baseball player. Yeah. These are all knocked out. Yeah. 
But it was a good game. Well, you know, I suspect part of that was just the longevity aspect. That yeah, I look back now. I mean, I played 18 years in the big leagues. I don't know if I would have played. I would have liked to have seen what I would have done in the NHL, though. Yeah. I really would have. I mean, that game, you give someone an elbow, you get a two-minute penalty. You give someone an elbow here, they'll throw you out of base. They'll throw you off for three games. Right, right. You can get, you know, you get a little physical. Good game. Bobby, I know Bobby. Uh, I see some of the... I go down to Tampa. I see Phil Esposito once in a while. Phil's a character. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, I think hockey players are, are the nicest down-to-earth players in any sport. I mean, I was telling someone the other night, I think the Stanley Cup, to win the Stanley Cup is the toughest thing to win in any sport. You've got to win four series. You've got to win 16 games. See, when the Bruins beat Vancouver a couple of years ago, they were 16-9, and nine, and they won the... I mean, and the four series you're playing are all good teams. You only play probably have a night off and you're playing every other night. I think winning the Stanley Cup is tougher than any sport. I kind of lost track last night. The, the Rangers and the Flyers, after they had no break. It just went right from yeah. Game 6 to Game 7. Well, they try, yeah, they, yeah. Wow. they're playing tonight. Oh, was it tonight? Thank tonight, you. they're playing in Pittsburgh, yeah. Okay. But it's, uh, I'll be, I'll be uh, well, it's a 12-30 game tomorrow. I won't see too much of it. But it's a good game. I know I've extended your time, and this has been incredible for me. Yeah, I mean, I, I could, let me tell you, I could talk here until the sun went down. I yeah. got more stories. <laughs> well, maybe sometime when it permits, I'd, I'd love to have that. Yeah, come back. You know where I'm going to be. Yeah, well, I do. Can I get you to autograph that there? Just sort of, that'd be terrific. We're both. Oh, and it up here, baby. This has been a real thrill for me, Richie. You have a lot of fans in Jamestown, New York. It's very close to Warren, Pennsylvania, which is a hotbed of pirate activity. You know, I always try to get back with the pirates. I call them. They never call me back. I would always, yeah. They're struggling. They lost a doubleheader last night. Oh, they're having a, oh. Steve Blass, when he was talking, you know, after, you know he, he's a terrific speaker, and he tells a lot of good war stories. Steve Blass is one of the funniest guys you want to be around. Yeah. I do fantasy games with him. He yeah. could go to Vegas on stage, one man show, and he had everybody laughing. He's just he's got that knack. Yeah. You know, he's he did he tell you he played golf about four or five years ago? No. He got two hole in ones in one round. Oh you're kidding. Now what's the chance I told him when he told me that story, I said, I hope you went out and bought a um, a Powerball ticket. <laughs> he got two hole in ones in one round. I guess.